great. Um, what am I saying? So, <laughs> um, I grew up in West Everton, in Liverpool, um, in the 80s, under a Thatcher government. Um, sadly, it was and still is the fourth most deprived area in the UK. So, quite bad housing, really awful health, which is shocking. Um, even now, when you look at the stats with global health as well, high unemployment, um, people were labelled massively outside of Liverpool, um, but also inside of Liverpool, Everton was not the place to grow up at all. And I remember people, we always take the piss out of ourselves as like a thing of, you know, don't be depressed, just have a laugh about how horrific things can be. And I remember someone saying, if the Iron Lady came here, she'd rust. <laughs> Says a lot. Um, but there's a silver line in, in the fact that I was surrounded by doers. This is in our local paper in the Echo, um, and it was local people and both bishops of Liverpool um, squatting in houses to save good local housing that were going to be demolished by the council to build a park that no one wanted in the area that would have made the area more unsafe and would have shipped people out of the area where generations had lived and grown up in a very close-knit community. So that's why it says pulpit power. So from a very early age, I learned that media was very important to win a campaign, getting very influential people like the WI, who are highly influential, but here, like both bishops coming along and getting local people together and seeing that local people were not what we were labelled. We were bloody hard working and had incredible talents. And from an early, early age, I saw that people had incredible gifts and talents, really hard work and really wanted to do a lot, but there were structures and stereotypes keeping them from doing that, um, which still upsets me now. Um, this little boy with a mullet is me. <laughs> my mum used to cut my hair. It was awful. We, we ripped up all the pictures of us, me and my sister, because they were just so bad. Um, so, you know, I was an observer. And... I'm, I didn't really feel like one of these people. I was three, so that was different. But growing up with them, I always admired people really doing stuff, you know, doing stuff that was hard, saying stuff people didn't want to hear but needed to be said, supporting people when they could have just focused on themselves. You know, given what little they had, it was an incredible thing to say. But I'm quite a shy person, really. I'm an introvert, which means being around lots of people actually drains me of energy. I like one-to-ones and being on my own a lot. My dad's a local vicar, so I grew up in the area, but my parents aren't from Liverpool, so we were a little bit different. Um, my parents taught us to swear before we went to nursery so that we'd fit it in, so that was helpful. Um, and I did, I was very passionate, and I was surrounded by a very loving family, which is brilliant, and incredible people. Um, and very angry about injustice issues, but I didn't feel like I could be them. You know, I think a lot of us in the room, hopefully not now, but we always see doers as over there. You're either a doer or you're a creative, or you're not, and you're not creative and you're not a doer. And I want to talk a bit about that. Um, the next slide says, evil flourishes when good people do nothing. So I'd see all of this stuff, and then I'd see people going along their day-to-day -day lives, and I'd be very angry. But I knew what, they were all good people. But I thought, why is all this shit happening? Whether it's local issues, whether it's global issues. I was very lucky. The only sabbatical my dad ever took, because he works too hard. We went to South Africa in 91. Mandela had just got out. We were there for a month, hopping around local schools and churches and seeing the incredible stuff they were doing. So I knew awful things could happen. But the people were generally lovely. And it, it was just this weird tension that I found that it's always in me that shit happens, even if we are good people. So we need to be as proactive as possible, really. So this talk, I want to talk about a few, my journey sort of as a doer. Um, so it's, you guys are mostly doers, so it's sort of not really for you, it's for the people who are watching on that. Um, so some of our craftivists and some other people is to say, I thought doers had to be this different species, but actually it's not. Um, the first thing that I was in my stage of doers was I was a reluctant doer. 
So the first thing that happened to me was that I was asked in school, um, it was a bit of a weird system, the teachers would come together and decide who to nominate as head girl. So head girl is where you um, are the chair of all of the prefects and across the school and you represent you know, the pupils. And I was put on this nomination list, which was a shock to me because I wasn't the popular kids. I was one of the alternative kids in our little alternative music corner. I wasn't my sister, who's who was very loud and brilliant, and I think people thought I was a bit like her, and I was absolute opposite. Um, and I didn't think, I thought, why have you picked me? So I remember sitting on my mum and dad's bed after school saying, okay, so I've been nominated for this, and I, I don't want to do it, and I'm sure someone else will get it because I'm not the popular kid. But I do think it would be good for someone to represent the peoples and not do it because they want it to look good on their UCAS form or something. And, you know, what do you think? Do you think maybe I could do it? Because I know a bit about community organising from watching them, so it was a bit different. So they said, oh, why don't you go for it? And also, I was very angry that there was a girl called Hayley, who I knew would be a brilliant head girl, and wasn't nominated. And I thought, what the fuck? She would have been boss. <laughs> so... So I was reluctant, but I stood up with everyone and we all said why we'd be head girl. And the first thing I said was, in my little, like, cocky scout thing, I was like, well, I don't think the teachers should have nominated pupils because I think Hayley would have been really good and she should be up here. I don't know why I'm up here and got a bit on my high horse. And the head teacher stood up and started shouting. And I was like, oh, OK. And then I just said, look, I'll, you know, I'll try and support you. Um, you know, it's a bit scary, but I'll try and be the best head girl for you guys. And I got it, which was scary again. Um, but it was good because it got me out of my comfort zone. We saw that all the students were carrying very heavy bags. So I campaigned to win lockers. So I went around the school. I thought we could get lockers. I knew we had a bit of money in the school, and it was a citywide school. And the teacher said, no, we can't have lockers. It's health and safety. So I spoke to the caretaker, and he went, no, no, we don't know it's health and safety. So both of us got together, we measured all the corridors and saw that it wasn't a health and safety problem. So again, I noticed straight away that if I could get one very powerful person who's on your side, who's a multiplier and respected, and they go, hang on a minute, let's try. We won lockers for the school, which for everyone was a bit of a dream, and I thought, well, let's have a go, and we did it. And another campaign was that I wanted recycling in the school because I was passionate about climate change, which was a bit hidden, and it got me scared. And I thought, well, recycling is something we can do. And again, the teacher said that if we have paper bins, um, everyone will throw a light in it, and the whole school will go on fire. So we did it for a week, and no one put the school on fire. <laughs> So we kept them going, but they'd only do it in the reception area in a couple of rooms. So we half won that. We then campaigned to eradicate gym knickers from the pee kit, which are horrible things. We were in a city centre school where we'd run in gym knickers around the outside of the school. And we were in an area where there was prostitutes and care crawlers. So we're running around as a girls' school in gym knickers. <laughs> we already hate what our bodies look like. And we had to do that. So I got, we all got angry with that. And we thought we'd campaign on that. My throat's so dry. Um, so we campaigned on that. We lost that campaign, even though we put our most passion into that one, because we had one PE teacher, and she knows who she is, who was so stubborn, we literally couldn't get anywhere. So again, I learned a lot from that. I learned that even one person can, can just be that barrier, and we need to figure out ways to campaign differently. Another thing, another step I had um, as a doer was that I remember um, one year, one summer, Primark was going to open an enormous store on our main high street. And if you don't know already, Primark, not particularly the most ethical company, they do use sweatshops. They don't say they do. They signed up to the ETI, but that doesn't mean that they don't use them, because they do. And it's very cheap clothing, it's very fast fashion, lots of issues about putting clothes in landfill. Charity shops can't sell clothes. I used to work for Oxfam, and they couldn't sell uh, Primark clothes because no one would buy them and then they'd have to recycle them which costs more so it's all a bit of a mess so I thought okay well it's happening surely someone's going to stand outside there'll, there'll be a campaign outside if people go in you know 
let's not. Let's just be aware, and maybe not, if we can possibly help it, shop in Primark. So I kept asking people, you know, anyone, is anyone doing anything? Because I'm sure, I'm sure there is, because I kept hearing people excited about going to Primark, which made me really angry as well, but I didn't really know how to deal with it, because you don't want to scream at people and all of that stuff. But nothing was happening, and it was in the summer, so no students were there, so no students were campaigning. So within a, with a week to go, I thought, no, fuck it, I'm going to have to do something, really. So I grabbed 10 friends, most of them had never campaigned before. We did handmade placards, um, we put all the stats on, so I got in, uh, in touch with War on One Charity and said, give us all the stats needed. Phoned up Liberty, which is a free line for activists to get advice on how to tell the police so that you're doing it all legal, what you could be done for, which is mostly littering, so we need to make sure that flyers weren't left on the floor, all of that stuff. And we just did it, and we, we had our little placards, and people were booing us, and lots of people were going, that's, that's not true, that's completely false. And we're going, well, here's some of the stuff, so maybe just be aware of it. And it was horrible, <laughs> absolutely horrible. I hated doing it, but I thought, we need to see both sides, really. And my friends and the other people who came, you know, it was tough. But we got on the local radio, we got in the local paper. It was just something for people to hear both sides and then decide. But I didn't like that I was, I was there quite angry and people were feeling attacked. I didn't like that. And I didn't like the fact that I had one old lady who came up to me very quietly um, and looked at me and said, what, what's all this about then? So I said, oh, you know, these are some of the things we just need to be aware of it. And if possible, ideally, not buy there and tell them that if you are customers or you want to be customers, they need to change their ways, like the waterman was saying. Um, and she started crying, and then I started crying, and she went, but I have to buy there because I can't afford anywhere else. So I gave her a little card that she could staple her receipt on, which you give to the manager and say, as a customer, I said to her, you know, you're powerful as a customer. Put it in the card, ask the manager that you're not happy with this, and can they report back? And they have to say it's a airline manager that this is happening. So she did it. But it meant that, as a doer, I was thinking, OK, I don't like the screaming bit, but it's good that we got in the paper. And I learned a lot from the other campaigns in school. I didn't like how this woman felt. and. You know, you never want to make anyone cry, but should we make each other cry sometimes? So it was this constant thing of how do we challenge each other, but empower each other and not label each other. And it was, it was a difficult thing to do. The next way I was a doer was that I ended up working for large um, global charities because it was sort of in you know, learning a lot about, I'm a bit of a geek on campaigning and learning a lot about it, and then ended up sort of working for a charity, um, and quite large charities, and I moved to London for the job, because most of them were there, um, and at the same time as doing the job, and it was a really, it was ridiculous targets for a job, it was a differed project, and it was huge, and we were learning it from scratch, so it was amazing, but it was bloody exhausting. And I was joining lots of activist groups, thinking I'm going to be with my people, I'm going to meet like-minded people, and I, you know, I want to help serve the world, and I want to make sure that I'm not part of the problem, but part of the solution as much as possible. Um, but I joined groups where it was too extrovert for me. I didn't like dressing up and, you know, on the stage. <laughs> um, didn't like that. Could, I'm too scared to ride a bike. So, you know, when they all went off on their bikes, I'd be on the bus. A little bit different. I, I'm not vegan, which stopped a lot of stuff. I love reading Vogue, and I like fashion. There's lots of reasons I didn't really fit into the activist world and lots of the different ones. I like being on my own, as I was saying. I don't like telling people what to do. I don't like marching. don't like demonizing people, which is what we tend to do. So in my work and in my personal life, there was some stuff I knew was good, but I felt completely burnt out, and I didn't agree with some of it, and I felt like there was a real gaping hole where I was just telling people to be robots. There was clicktivism, slacktivism, quickly sign this, this is really important. There's so many things to do, it was overwhelming, and I didn't th feel like I was helping people learn about global issues and what they could do as global citizens, and that transformational work that we should all be doing. I was just doing transaction after transaction. So... I turned into a very doubting doer to the point that I thought maybe I just need to not do, really. Um, so I was still doing my job, but feeling like, oh, I don't think this is for me. 
And at the same time, randomly, I picked up a craft kit because I was traveling a lot around the country with work and I get travel sick, so I can't read because I just want to like sway and vomit. So I was stitching because I, I like creating, I like crafting, I like, well, I like painting and drawing, so I had that itchy feeling of wanting to be creative. So I started doing this craft kit and straight away I noticed it slowed me down. It, because it was very repetitive, because it's hand embroidery or cross stitch that I focus on, it meant that you got in a bit of a flow. It meant that I couldn't tweet, I couldn't, I couldn't Instagram or Pinterest, I couldn't do lots of stuff together. I could just focus. It was scary thinking about how maybe I didn't, I'd had to stop fighting for a better world and I couldn't do it. So I was thinking, well, how can I do it and how can I do my job right? And I thought this craft is bloody brilliant and it can help me really try and engage back into activism. Maybe it could help other people. So I googled craft and activism, and I, um, I saw this word craftivism pop up. So I contacted the woman who coined it in 2003, Betsy Greer, and said, this, I think craft is brilliant, and I think there's lots of ways it could help with activism. Are there any groups I could join, any projects I could do? And there wasn't. Her blog was sort of looking throughout history of where craft had been used by the suffragettes and by women in Chile and by lots of different people for different reasons about bereavement, about community, but nothing really about the activism that I was looking at. So I thought, okay, once again, I thought, right, I don't want to stop doing, I'm a dubbin, I'm a stubborn doer. So I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and do stuff. And this was the craft that got me into it, the cross stitch, of feeling in control of stuff and thinking, well, at least I can do these little crosses and these little stitches, and maybe that can, I can be some good use in the world. Um, and I started worrying about the roots I was doing. You know, as an activist, I was worried that I'd forgot that people were other people and that I was treating them badly. And I wanted to get activism back into what my morals were and roots were, which are things, you know, the roots and the foundations that we all need to not burn out. Like, we need purpose, we need honesty, we need solidarity, we need to reflect, we need to forgive people, we need courage, we want equality, we need some knowledge of stuff, but we need to respect people. So I wanted all of this stuff within my craftivism and doing activism. So I thought a lot about it, and then I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll start doing stuff. Maybe I'll, in my chair I cross it says, it's easy to sit up and take notice, which is what I did. What's difficult is getting up and taking action. But I thought, well, I, I'm going to have a go. So I went up to Shetland, where my nan lives, in the middle of nowhere, with a bag of craft, a passion to change the world where possible, and started making mini protest banners, which are these little things. And it was a reaction to different forms of activism. And I thought, I don't like seeing giant banners plunked in front of my face going, do this now. I don't like people telling me what to do, even when I know they're right. I avoid them. So I thought if I cross-stitch little banners with quotes and stats and facts and things to provoke people but not preach at them that were shocking but not too demonizing, so might put it, it's always off eye level so people find it rather than it go and look at me, look at me because we're very good at not looking at stuff doing that. And I'd put it in relevant places. So I'd leave a fact outside Topshop about how Kate Moss would get three million quid to endorse a line, but Mauritian workers would get 21p an hour. And I'd have my little label so people could Google a label, find out more about the issue, click on different hyperlinks for more information or for actions to take. But it was very much letting them figure it out themselves because if they can take ownership of it, you know, we know that we're more likely to look into things than if people just shout at us. Some of it was funny swear words. It was for different audiences. I did one on violence where some gangs would hang out by my work and it was a Scorsese quote saying, it seems to me that any sensible person must see that violence does not change the world if it does, only temporary. And I thought they're probably under a lot of pressure with guns and crime to, you know, say, this is me and I'm in this tribe. But if they'll listen to Martin Scorsese, not me, and they'll love his films. So I thought that might be interesting. So I started doing these, and I hoped that people might look at them and look at the website, maybe tweet them, Instagram them, share them with people, or just go somewhere afterwards and go, I saw this really weird thing, and just provoke a conversation and get activism out into, outside of the activism bubble. And that 
happened, which was brilliant, and I started doing other projects, which was um, testing things out and just trying to do things, um, and people were engaged in it, to the point that lots of media got engaged in it, and I didn't promote that at all, because it makes me uncomfortable, <coughs> but it got out into places, and I thought, oh, there's something about this, but it was very much about being a, a quiet doer. I didn't want to do it with other people. I wanted to figure out what I was doing, see some issues and test them out. So I was being a quiet doer. I also wanted to be a gentle doer because I'd moved to a, a new flat in Battersea uh, when I was in London and I was doing what a typical activist often does. You know, when we're on autopilot, we do things without thinking. And I was signing lots of petitions and petition cards and flinging them to my MP, going, I care about this, this, this and this, which I do passionately. <laughs> And I got an email back from her office saying, stop emailing us. Uh, it's a waste of your time, waste of our time. And then the, the dagger in the heart was, they were like, and it's a waste of charity's money. And I thought, what? You're a crap MP. I care about these issues. Surely you want my vote? And then I started thinking, actually, she's a new MP. She was very new to the area. She hadn't been an MP before. She got in with a lot of support from her party, had very different ideologies to my MP. So of course she didn't see me as a voter. So what was the point of me doing all this stuff? She didn't know I genuinely cared because I was just quickly sending them. I'd always change the beginning and the end of emails, but she was changing them. So I decided to <coughs> embroider a handkerchief because that's what you end up thinking, isn't it? <laughs> The one, she's, the one she's got is got little flowers on it, but it's the same size. And I wrote on it, Dear my MP, you can see her name and you can see it at the back. As my MP, I'm asking you to please use your powerful position to challenge injustices, change structures keeping people poor, and fight for a more just and fair world. I know being an MP is a tough and big job, but please don't blow it in capital letters. This is your chance to make a real positive difference. Smiley face. <laughs> Yours in hope, Sarah, with my surname and my postcode. And it was all written in my own handwriting and stitched over the top. And she could see, you can see, it took me hours. So I went and met her, because she has to, because she's my MP. And I got up early on a Saturday morning and tried to be nice to the local library. And I went, here you go, Jane. We don't know each other, but I've been emailing you because I really care about these issues, and I think it all links under inequality, you know, tax avoidance, <coughs> lots of stuff on climate change. I think we need to do lots of stuff on this. And I want to give you this to encourage you and to challenge you sometimes. I want to understand why you might vote differently and what we could agree with, and why did you become an MP, basically? And she took it and looked at it and saw the mess on the back and saw it took me hours and I smiled at it and said, so why did you want to be an MP? She told me lots, she opened up to me, she said she used to work for John Lewis, so now I always mention cooperatives and aren't they great, Jane, you know that, John Lewis is a cooperative. <laughs> She, she opened up about doing stuff on FGM, which is now in the papers a lot, but it wasn't at all a few years ago, and she was very passionate about that because we had a big Somalian community in our area. So I got her in touch with a WI group doing incredible stuff yeah. on that, and it got very national for s lots of different reasons, but that helped, and now she does a lot of massive stuff on that. And I noticed straight away that by giving this craft to someone, it opens them up. You build a relationship with someone, and it can be a really good physical tool to carry on a relationship with someone. So it's not a transaction. It's a tool. It's not about the craft for craft's sake. It's something to engage people with. Then I noticed that lots of people wanted to join in, which was a bit weird. So I turned into an ac accidental doer um, because people around the world started commenting on my blog and emailing me saying, I'm burnt out as well, or I'm a crafter, and I'm scared of activism, but I want to do good stuff, or I've always wanted to do stuff, but I've never felt like I fitted in, and this seems like something gentle I can get into. So I, I couldn't tell them to go away, could I, even though I'm an introvert, and was like, oh my word, what's going on here? This is weird. So I thought, well, if it's helpful for them, maybe we should do stuff. So we had groups, did events, people would come to, this is 70 people in the Haywood Gallery. 
started making kits for people because people were asking, saying, you've done the instruction video, but I need a bit more info, so can you do some kits for us? And then other people going, I don't really want to craft, but I do love the stuff and it provokes me and reminds me to do stuff. So I called them craftivists and we have a joke about it. And on our badges it says on the back, you're a change faker and not a change maker. And it was another clever way for them to wear it and people go, what, what the... And then they go, oh, yeah, there's this thing. And it just gets people talking and thinking and reminding us to be good human beings. And another accident was that we ended up with a little book because I did a project for a craft book, and the editor said, I want you to pitch something to me. And she had a small book on <laughs> moustaches, uh, really small, lots of pictures of moustaches. You know, it was a bit fashionable a while ago, not so fashionable now. Um, more about the beards, really, isn't it? And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch to her that I want a small, accessible book that's cheap for people to have. People can stick in Christmas stockings, keep in their bag, keep in their pocket, give it to people as an easy, light, gentle thing that might provoke people in a nice, encouraging way. I wanted it in craft shops like our, our craft projects. I wanted it in other shops where you don't normally see activism, not just the radical bookshops, but everywhere, sort of planting little seeds. Um, and we did that, which was good. And then all these organisations wanted to work with it. And I used to, I used to work for Christian Aid, Difford, and then Oxfam. And Oxfam have an enormous brand. But we couldn't get into WIs. We couldn't get into some of this stuff, even though we were the biggest name in the UK. Um, and they were coming to me, going, could we do stuff with you? And I'm really passionate about getting people thinking outside of where they have to go as an activist or they feel like they need to go. So I, do, I work for, uh, with the V&A doing um, workshops every few months where we get 150 people in and out of the door on a Sunday, sitting for hours with families or on their own, stitching and reflecting on refugees for Refugee Week, issues about belonging, looking about how we can be our best selves at Christmas, what's a star for us, lots of different things to quietly get people thinking. We were on stage with Josie Long um, for six shows at Souls Out shows, stitching away, and she'd introduce us and then ask at the end what we'd stitched. So we were getting stuff out there. So it was, it seemed like something that was working. And now I'm a full-time craftivist running the collective is this thing which is scary but exciting. And I'm excited to, I really want a craftivist caravan to take around that's a quiet place for people to think and read and stitch. And I want a craftivist clinic where I can give them beautiful prescriptions after talking to them about what they could do and what films they might like to engage them or what comics they might like or small things they could do to be more ethical or to campaign on something they care about, give them little given them a craftivist clinic. But I really, my last thing of, at the moment, I just feel like I, I hopefully am, and I want to be a helpful doer. I want to be my best self and help the world where I can and not harm it. And I want other people to be their best selves. Um, so I want people to become who they are because I think we are all incredible people. And what's so weird about the do lectures is on the car on the way here, I was in with the breathing man talking about do well, do be uh, well doing. And I'm doing a project with Falmouth Uni at the moment and neuroscientists and different um, people within uh, the Arts Council about well making. We called it well making before you even spoke. And then I tweet, I checked on Twitter, no one's using well making. So there's a weird thing going on in this do place. The final thing I want to say, and I don't know what time it is at all. The final thing I want to say is not to tell you what to do, but I thought it might be helpful because it's helpful for me. I made myself this time last year I was on holiday which was amazing to have a holiday. And I stitched myself something and it says, Dear Tired Sarah, if you can't read it, don't forget what William Arthur Ward said. I will do more than belong. I will participate. I will do more than believe. I will practice. I will do more than dream. I will work. I will do more than give. I will serve. And I will do more than live. I will grow from your energetic and hopeful self, Sarah. Thanks.